Have a happy Sunday. Good morning, Palhurst. The psalmist tells us, How great is your goodness, O Lord, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. In the shelter of your presence you hide them, and in your dwelling place you keep them safe. Praise be to the Lord, for he has shown his wonderful love to me.
the future I've been blessed beyond all measure I am counting every blessing I'm counting every blessing I'm letting go and trusting when I cannot see I am counting every blessing I'm counting every blessing Another week in a world that is broken and um, and in confusion, and, and I hope that this week we have lived um, as as people of God, and and that has changed our behavior so that we have behaved well. That is by um, listening carefully, by speaking sensitively, by speaking truthfully, and by repenting as and the need arises. It's been a hard week, hasn't it? I think they all are. And, and a little bit discouraging, not only in what we see in the news, um, but also in what just came out recently about our phase one in Multnomah County. Oh, that was really disheartening. We were planning on the uh, first, first couple of weeks of July being able to open, and now who knows? And of course, we'll keep you posted on all that. But I just ask that you, you pray for us, especially as elders, as we try to figure out what's the, what's the right thing to do here and how, how are we supposed to balance all these things. Uh, it's difficult. But speaking of prayer, let's uh, begin praying right here. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our country. I thank you for the immense bounty that we have had here. We thank you for the, the freedoms that we have and, and the wide spectrum of, of people and, and cultures and perspectives that, that make up our country. I do pray, Father, that you would give us calmness in our country. I pray that there would be hope. And I pray that that hope would, would not be in government programs or, or movements, but our hope would be in, in you. I pray that that would open the door for the gospel, the only true hope for mankind. And may we be part of that. And then I ask, Lord, also that soon and very soon we might be able to meet together as a body. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, we're at a point in 1 Peter where we're about to come to a major shift. And so I want to do a flyover of 1 Peter so far. You know, I want to avoid the idea that we run into 1 Peter, grab a fortune cookie here, grab a fortune cookie here, but rather show how it all fits together so we get Peter's point and what he's trying to do. So starting back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, we have the first section, which is our living hope. We have salvation. And the prophets, before they talked about it, and they said, this is going to be great. And, and in the future, someday we're going to be in heaven. And we're going to say, wow, it's just turned out fantastic. But even now, in this age, on, on April, hmm, what do you see in this? April 12th, I, wait, this is May. <laughs> anyway, right now, right now, we are already enjoying the great effects of salvation. As it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 through 9. Though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Those are excellent words, and they're just so uplifting. And we wonder, Peter, just couldn't you go on for another five chapters just talking about these great things, just kind of camp here? But Peter's purpose is not just to tell us what a great salvation we have. He wants to take that and he wants to to use that to move us to the kind of people we ought to be, or the kind of people we actually already are. And so we move on to number two, our changing lives in chapter 1, verse 13 through chapter 2, verse 3. He says you should be changed and have been changed, and, and now you live with respect towards God and his character, and and, and you behave in different ways. In fact, he even says this in chapter 1, verse 15. Just as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all you do. That's an excellent challenge to us, an excellent statement to us. And, uh, And the things he says to us, we have to apply to our lives. But what Peter says in, the, in that section is, is not to be disparaging, but, but they're kind of general. And that's not enough for Peter. Peter says, I, I don't want to just kind of give some general terms. I want to be specific, give some specific guidelines to these people, to us here in the 21st century, about how they are to live in this present world. Peter realizes that the things he's about to say are hard and challenging. And so before he does that, he prefaces it with this section we've just finished, which is number three, our uplifting identity in chapter two, verses four through 10. Here he talks about Jesus as the cornerstone and how because of Jesus, we have been changed and transformed and we have a whole new identity. That's, <laughs> that's great. Uh, first Peter chapter two, verse nine. Now, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Oh, out of dark, wonderful light, holy priesthood. This is just, this is amazing stuff. This is excellent. However, here's the thing. Being in such an amazing position is great, except for the fact that it puts us in a very difficult position. (laughs) Because now we live as people who, take these out, people who know God and have communion with him and are in our lives trying to please him and do the things that would honor him. And we live in a world that does not know God that is separate from him and is not even interested in pleasing God. We live in a world that is, is, is dark. You know, we've given revelation, we've been given light, we've been given clarity on things, but we live in a world that is in rebellion and does not want to hear it and does not live in light but in darkness. Um, that's, that's awkward, isn't it, <laughs> in a way? More than that, it's, it's kind of scary because... Here's a word that's been in the news a lot lately. Systemic. 
Well, let me apply that word in a very truthful fashion right here. And that is this. We live in a world that has systemic evil in it. Uh, sin has pervaded men and women's hearts. It pervades our family structures, our, our government, our finance, the way that we conduct ourselves in Portland or Multnomah County or, or in the United States or in the world. Sin is systemic. And that puts us in a hard position. In fact, Peter says, now you are, the word he uses is you are strangers. He, this is in, 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 uh, in the verse coming up. You are strangers. In other words, you don't belong here. You don't fit here. For you and me, it's always going to be uncomfortable. It's always going to be a little, little awkward, disconnected from things. You know, we should never feel comfortable. And maybe that's a good thing to see all the injustice and sin that we've seen in, the, in recent weeks and, and see all the time. Uh, because it reminds us that this is not the ideal. This is not heaven. And this is not our home. Peter says, you're strangers and you are sojourners. <laughs> the idea there is you are here temporarily. And we as Christians ought to always have one eye kind of looking up to heaven. I remember reading this verse when I was a younger person. Revelation 22:20. 20. He who testifies to these things, that's Jesus, says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen, says John. Come, Lord Jesus. Or I like the King James. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And, and when I was younger, I would think, well, no, no, not, not quite yet. I still got some things I'd really like to do, some things I'd really like to experience. So can you hold off just a little bit? But you know what? When we come face to face with sin and evil in the world, systemic as it is, and, and realize this is the way the world is going to be, sometimes our heart cry is, Please, Lord, come. Come quickly. We're in a difficult position. Now, how does Peter want us to deal with it? We're in this difficult position. How are we supposed to deal with it? Now, there's one solution that some people have tried, and that is escape. <laughs> that is, uh, go to an island somewhere. Get all the Christians and put them on an island somewhere so they don't have to be with the worldly people. Or maybe, hmm, here's something that's been tried a monastery, build a wall, keep them outside, or, or a commune. I understand uh, David Koresh's old place is up for rent now. Maybe we should handle this whole thing like a spiritual coronavirus. And that is, in order to keep ourselves from being infected by all this stuff, we just kind of avoid. We don't go out anymore. We keep away from all that. And we just hide ourselves away. By the way, when we follow that escape plan, we are also following another plan, even though we may not know it, and that is the abandonment plan, which basically says, we're saved, you're not, and we don't care. You're on your own, we're going to our island. Mm, doesn't sound very scriptural, does it? Matter of fact, it's not. Peter says in chapter 2, verse 9, he says all this, that, that you may declare the praises of him. Well, if we're on our, if we're on our island all by our lonesome, how are we supposed to declare the praises? Who do we declare to? Well, maybe to one another, but certainly not to people. And look at chapter 2, verse 12. He says about the world that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. If we separate ourselves out in some way, how are they going to see our good deeds? How are we going to be able to act and do those good deeds to them? How are they ever going to be able to glorify God when we've completely removed ourselves as God's people from their picture? Look at chapter 3, verse 15, where he says, Be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. <laughs> How are they going to see the hope that we have? How are they going to ask us questions? How are we going to give an answer if we're all the way over on our island? You know, Peter would say, this is not the way to do it. By the way, I don't think any of us, I've, I've never heard of a proposal where someone said, hey, why don't we at Palhurst uh, build big walls around our property or, or go live on an island? No one, no one wants to do that. But you know, sometimes we do isolate ourselves. Some people do it deliberately. Some Christians do it deliberately. They say the world's a bad place. We don't want to have anything to do with it. You know? I think most likely what happens, though, is we do it um, unconsciously. 
I think it works like this. I really like being with you guys. I really love you. I mean, we are linked together by the Savior. And we have so much in common. Yeah, we have some disagreements, but we can see them as disagreements and say, well, they're minor. We have so much in common. We, it's, 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 it's comfortable. It's enjoyable. We love to be together. That's why this coronavirus thing has been so hard. We love that. And, um, and so we hang out together. And, and sometimes what happens in a Christian's life is pretty soon they only hang out with Christians. So it's very possible to have all our friendships, all our conversations, all our time, all that we do wrapped up with Christians. And isn't that kind of like being on an island all by ourselves? No, we haven't physically moved anywhere, but essentially we're all by ourselves. I think we as Christians, especially the longer that we walk with Christ, we need to be intentional about this, remembering that we're on a mission here, that we're supposed to love people, that we would pray for people around us. We would focus on certain particular individuals that we come across and reach out to them and strive to be friends to them and drive, strive to have this connection with them. You've got to do it. Otherwise, you're essentially living on an island and unable to fulfill the mission that God has for us, unable to fulfill the things that Peter has told us. Now, he says, don't escape. Don't abandon. Instead, live. In it. This is the whole thing that underlines the things he's going to say. Live in the midst of this world. I like how Paul says it. He says, uh, uh, as shining lights, as you, as you hold out the light in this world of darkness, we're, we've got the light now, we're in the darkness, and that's a good place for us to be so that we can really, really shine. Stay in the midst. Now, being in the midst of the world is not comfortable. Talked about that. It's, uh, it's difficult at times. In, in fact, sometimes it gets kind of, kind of complicated, and that's why now, Peter moves on to give specific guidelines about how we're supposed to live in the world. And that's number four, our challenging stance. That's the segment we're entering today. It starts in chapter 2, verse 11, and goes all the way through chapter 3, verse 12. And it's basically all about how to live in a fallen world. How to live in a fallen world with brothers and sisters who aren't fallen. How to live in a fallen world in the family structure. How to live in a fallen world in the whole master-slave thing. That'll be a weird one. How to live in a fallen world with the government and how to live in a fallen world with everyone, which is what we look at in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Uh, let, me, uh, let me read that for us. Beloved, I urge you as strangers and sojourners to abstain from sinful desires which make war against your souls. Um, having such good conduct among the Gentiles that whereas they slander you as evildoers, because they see your good deeds, they will glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 11 begins by saying, I urge you. Uh, but remember, this is an apostle. Uh, this is an apostle writing inspired scripture. So you could better, you could very well say, I command you. It's a good thing to remember right here at the beginning that um, we are owned by God. He has saved us. He is our Lord. We submit ourselves to him. We follow him in whatever he says. Let's not be like toddlers who, when they're told to do something they don't want to do, throw themselves on the ground and start crying. Or when they're told they can't have something they want, throw themselves on the ground and start crying. Let's not be like that. Let us be obedient children. <clears throat> now, the first thing Peter says is, number one, steer clear. He says, apexisthai. Um, I, I urge you, I, I command you to keep away from. Keep away from what? Keep away from desires. Now, that's a word that is neutral. It can be used of very positive things, um, or it can be used of very negative things. In this instance, it's very negative. And you can see that because he adds this adjective to it. Uh, keep away from fleshly desires. Now, when I hear fleshly desires, I immediately, you probably do too, if you're honest, um, think of sex, so sexual sin. So um, um, sexual activity, uh, 
without being married or when you are married having sexual activity with somebody other than your partner or or homosexual activity or or indulging in pornography that's that's what i think of when i when i look at these but you could also say well i mean not just sex but also since fleshly anything physical so uh, when i abuse substances or or food or or drink or or when I'm lazy, or when I'm out of control in, in different appetites that I have, or maybe if I use my physical body in a violent way, that that would be uh, some physical desires. Yeah. And that's true. But actually, the word here is, is wider than that even. It's actually just another word for sinful. It's talking about the sin nature. So anything sinful, so selfishness, or or covetousness, or, or pride, or or racism, or or gossip, or or fits of rage and anger, or disobedience, or or stealing, or being dishonest, or 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 anything, anything at all that is contrary to God's character, that is contrary to Scripture, that is contrary to my identity in Jesus Christ. Now, Peter says, abstain from these sinful desires. Why? Why should we? Now, it's interesting what Peter says. He could have said, abstain from these sinful desires because they don't fit with your new identity. You're, you're holy now. You're, you're changed. You're altered. These don't fit. He could have said that. He doesn't. He could have said, um, abstain from these things because you're in a new family now and you're supposed to represent your new family. You are representatives of God himself, of his character. So you don't want to... Uh, you don't want to uh, um, shame him. You don't want to embarrass him or disparage his, his character by behaving wrongly. And you don't want to give other people the wrong picture of who God is. So behave better. He could have said that. He doesn't. He doesn't say um, abstain from sinful desires because of your new siblings, your new brothers and sisters. You wouldn't want to hurt them with these sinful behaviors, would you? Or you wouldn't want to mislead them into the same sinful behavior. So behave better for that reason doesn't say that either. Instead, he says, abstain from them, and then he puts it in terms of you, your individual soul. He says soul, not in the sense of the body versus the soul, but in the sense of the, of the real self, of who you are. These things, he says, are against your soul. They're contrary to your soul. They are bad for you. They bring harm to you. That's a good thing to remember. You know, this is something you've probably heard in the sermon before. Sin is bad. Do you believe that? I see a... I, yeah, yeah, I think you agree with me on that. That's, that's a scriptural statement. However, don't we sometimes think that sin, in certain instances, is, is good or, or partly good? Or maybe we wouldn't say good. Maybe we say sin is necessary or sin is... Uh, is useful or, or, or sin is helpful in some ways. In other words, yes, sin is bad, but it, it's also a little bit good. Uh, let me give you some examples. Maybe uh, we realize that being drunk is, is, is wrong, is sinful, and yet, you know, I've really had a bad week and a lot of stress has come in my life. I just need to forget for a while, so this is something I need. So yeah, it's bad, but it's also a, a little bit good or or maybe bragging. We know that's bad, but but maybe maybe um, we uh, think to ourselves, yeah. But but if I'm going to succeed in my business, or if I'm going to have people really see how great I am, I'm going to have to speak up for myself. So I know it's bad, but it's it's also it's also kind of good. Or stealing things that don't belong to me. Yeah, I, I know that's bad, but you know, if I'm going to be able to pay the bills, if I'm going to be able to take care of my family, I'm, I'm going to need to I'm going to need to steal. So I know it's bad. But, it, but it's also a little bit necessary. Or, or let's take uh, pride, feeling exalted about myself, how great I am. And I know that's bad, but, you know, I've really been a lot of damage, and so I, I really don't feel good to myself, so I, I make up for that, and I protect myself by being really proud. It's kind of a protective mechanism, so, yeah, it's bad, but it's, 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 it's also uh, kind of good. Or, or forgiveness. I know I'm supposed to forgive, and unforgiveness is a sin, but... You know, I, I've really been hurt badly, and, and, and to forgive someone would hurt me even worse. And, and so I know unforgiveness is bad, 
but it's 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 better than the alternative, uh, and so it's it's kind of good. Or or gossip. I, I know gossip is wrong, but if I don't gossip, then this other person won't find out about this person, and they won't ever be caught in what they're doing. So yeah, it's bad, but it's kind of good. Or immorality. I know that sex outside of marriage is bad, but I have this relationship with first person and. Forgive me for how I put this, but if I don't put out, then it's going to be over and I'm going to miss out on what is really a healthy relationship. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's bad, but kind of good. Or, or, or anxiety. I, I, I know that ang- anxious and is, is a bad thing, is a sinful thing, is a, is a mistrust in God. And yet things are so bad in this world that this is how I deal with it. So, of course, it's bad, but it's also kind of Kind of good. Are no breaking things that don't belong to me or rioting, and that's that's bad. But boy, it's, injustice is, and we need to make a point so clearly that in this case, it's 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 bad, but it's all it's also kind of good. Whew. Peter would say to all those examples and to the ones you can think of for yourselves, no. You, you know, you might think that those things are helping you or people or society. You might think that those things are not hurtful. You might think that they're necessary. But you are absolutely wrong. They are not good. They they are bad. In fact, he says those things are not just bad. They will hurt, and they will hurt you bad, and they will hurt you badly. <laughs> and he uses the word there. That's a military term. It doesn't mean just they will fight against your soul. He says they will make war. They will strategize. They will conduct a military campaign against your soul. You you know, in the military, the object is not to dent the other side. The object is to defeat the other side, to destroy the other side. And that's why in a military campaign, there is an ongoing, uh, sustained effort uh, coming through all kinds of means, sometimes very sneaky or, or strategy, trying to trying to destroy that other person. That describes sin very well. It almost seems like a, a conscious effort to destroy us and a, and a cruel effort. And Peter says, abstain from those sinful desires. Not because Peter is, you know, unfun loving. Not because God is stern. And God looks at us in our lives and says, I want your life to be as dull and uninteresting as possible. So if I see anyone having any fun, I'm going to stop that. I don't want you doing that. Like a stern librarian. I used to have one like that in one of my schools. It was kind of like, "Mm, always looking for people, always sour, always looking for people having fun. And and, and any kind of whispering. (laughs) uh, Is that what God is like? Just looking to see and stop people from doing fun things? Absolutely not. It's not what Peter's saying here at all. He says sin is against God. It's against God's character. It's against the way he has set the universe up in the natural laws. It's the way, it's against the way human nature is actually supposed to be. And so when you sin, that is harmful. Those sins are corrosive. You know, when we conduct them, they actually eat away at us. They are toxic and poisonous. They're bad for us. You've known people with peanut allergies, you know, and and they might, especially those who have severe allergies, where even just a little bit is is too much, they might think that, that peanuts are tasty. They also realize that for them, it is toxic. And even a little bit is going to cause a a hiccup in their immune system, dump all kinds of histamine in them. They're going to have anaphylactic shock. There's going to be problems with breathing. There could be death because of it. And even a little bit will set them off. Friends, I think that's kind of what happens on a spiritual basis with the sin that we ingest, the desires, the sinful desires in which we indulge. Just a little bit is toxic. There is no safe amount of sin. It's all bad and all wars against our soul. What sin do you think of in your life that is, you know, harmless, hardly does anything at all? What sin do you think of that is a, that's trivial? <laughs> it's hardly anything, even on the radar. What sin is it that you think, 
yeah, but it's, it's necessary for me or for the situation. What sin is, do you think, yeah, it's bad, but it's also kind of good. And this would be a great time to think about that and turn. Remember that thing from last week? Repent, or whatever that is. Those things are not okay because of who you are, and because of what they do to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for the light that you give us. Help us to live as, as light in the darkness. Help us to live in this, in this dark world as light people, uh, living lives that are, are full of holiness and goodness. And, and Lord, that comes down, down to our individual souls. I pray that each one of us would be looking through our lives, listening to what the Spirit has to say, and living accordingly. Again, with the repentance, Lord, that's something we should be doing so much more. We, we are broken people. We are twisted in ways we can't even remember. It's taking you a lifetime to sanctify us, not because you are not powerful, but because you are working through us in a cooperative way to purify us and to change us into the image of your Son. And we look forward to what you're going to do in your life, in, in, in our lives. And we offer ourselves up for your work. Change us. Correct us. Clean us up purify us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who brought us to where we are today. In his name, amen. Hello, Powhurst family. We miss you. I wanted to give you my highs, lows, and achievements. My highs include Zoom meetings with family and, of course, our small group. Movie and pizza night. And then another one of my highs, achievements, and lows in the kitchen here. I spent some time polishing, cleaning and polishing the cabinets in the kitchen. So that was a high. Also an achievement. One of my lows, though, is putting up this curtain here. I was really frustrated and it was just kind of a low for me getting that frustrated. Our prayer for you is that you will leave here today saying it's been good to be in the house of the Lord together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and we just come to you in thankfulness, thankful that you it was your plan to send your son to die for my sins, for our sins. And we also are thankful that we have an advocate for us who continues to uh, uh, just be our advocate uh, in heaven. Uh, Father, we just um, know that things are uh, continue to just be uh, tough in the, in the world, continue to be uh, isolated, the things are loosening up, but we continue to be isolated. Then there are uh, the uh, marches, protests, even even riots they've been called. And we just ask for uh, your, your peace, uh, Father, though we know there won't be real peace until you return. We pray for those that are uh, struggling uh, physically with illnesses, that you will... Uh, just heal them. Uh, Father, we just pray for those who are uh, just are weighed down with heavy burdens, who are missing loved ones. We just ask that you will comfort them. And Father, we just thank you for this time that we have to be together to uh, worship and to uh, hear your word and to pray together. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Paul Hurst. Um, Drake was saying he needed some people to send some videos in, so I'm going to give it a try again. Um, some highs and lows. Um, well, today, working on taxes, that'll give you highs and lows all in itself. Um, some of the other highs and lows were uh, yesterday we had our fifth grade graduation um, at our school, so they did a drive-through, and it was fun to see the kids that did come through and celebrate but then of course we had you know the rain come down um, today is the last day officially of school 
um, which starts our summer break. So just trying to keep the emotions positive. Um, enjoyed being with our Palhurst family and the concert of prayer last night. Everybody stay safe. Bye. Hello, Palhurst family. I just wanted to do my highs and lows. So my highs are that I did get to have a friend here yesterday on Sunday, um, this past Sunday. Uh, I also got to, um, I got to do a lot of fun stuff. I got to go over to somebody's house. I got to go inside their house, even though it was kind of weird because I haven't been in anybody's house lately, like, except for, like, my own house. Uh, and I, uh, my lows are that the quarantine's still going on, and there's been a little activation alert where you have to be at home at a certain time, curfew times, which is kind of a low, and I'm not sure why that's even going on. And also, because of all the riots and stuff that's going on, it's also a low. Like, I, we haven't been bothered by it, but I'm pretty sure other are. So, also, you all have a great day. Bye. When I think of lows this week, I think of the word limitations. And as I look forward to gathering together again, eventually as a church body in our building, um, trying out different seating configurations to get our people in here as safely as possible and as many as we can, um, it's just really discouraging because it's really different. Um, the other idea with limitations is my son broke his wrist this week. And boy, there's a lot of limitations now with a cast. And it's really hard for me to see him missing out on these different experiences that he can't participate in because of his cast. So limitations, that's been a struggle this week. So later this summer, I get to officiate Caleb and Olivia's wedding. And I'm really looking forward to that. But my high for this week is actually tied into that where I had the incredible honor of being invited to be part of Caleb's bachelor party. Now, for a, a mid-40s uh, pastor that's officiating a wedding, it's kind of rare to be involved in someone's bachelor party, but what a neat time we had. We had some really neat, deep conversations, and we got to do some fun activities together, and just a neat time of bonding with people that I really care about. So that's my high for the week. Good morning, everybody at Power. This is Walter from Cornerstone. I think my eyes are waking up in the morning and singing praise to the good Lord. So I'm just waiting for the day I can be with all of you at the church, and I love and miss you all very much. Highs and lows. Lows is the, um, the lack of the social, especially meeting at church to see everybody. The high is finally I get to have a date night with my wife and we get to have a dine-in, sit-down dinner at a restaurant. Hi friends, hey, it's Jennifer here. Um, I just wanted to take a quick minute and, and thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Um, you, as you know, it's been a trying week. Um, Jay is doing okay. He is uh, frustrated and his voice is, or his mouth, his voice is fine. His mouth isn't working as well as we would like it to all the time, um, but he's doing okay. He's been off work because he can't uh, enunciate words clear enough sometimes for his clients to hear. So that's frustrating to him and it's scary. Um, we don't know anything yet. He hasn't had a stroke, so that's a positive. Um, we go to our doctor today to find out, but I just want to tell you how you have all been an encouragement to us. We love you. We miss you. We can't wait to see you. Take care. Have a blessed week. Good morning, Powellhurst family. So this is Shirley sharing a couple of highs and a couple of lows uh, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, you can probably tell that I am I have insulation behind me. I'm still not back in my house. There's still a lot of restoration uh, going on, but I do have um, 
a couple of silver linings in that. Um, in repiping my house, I am also getting a refurbished bathroom. So from a new tub and shower, shower surround and fixtures in the bathroom, um, that's gonna be more comfortable and it's gonna last me throughout my retirement. Woohoo! I also have a new uh, window in my bedroom and I haven't had a window in my bedroom for 25 years so I am looking forward to being able to uh, enjoy the the sunshine uh, when we get back into the house. I've also really enjoyed uh, visiting with with Walter and getting all the news that is uh, fit to report from him. I can't think of a, a very many lows, but uh, I am a little bit cramped in my hotel room, uh, but we're doing just fine and I'm actually cooking, cooking meals. Uh, one of the lows is I have uh, realized that I really need a haircut and I'm looking forward to that. Seeing God worked in me. I've been reading more, reading the Bible, FaceTiming with family and friends, helping me when my aunt passed it, and being blessed that she's with God now. How has God blessed in me? Having a great family, not giving up when I had surgery and chemo.